Sometimes, billionaires can be some of the most down-to-earth people you could ever meet. I know we may tend to think of them as untouchable beings who are far beyond our reach, but that is certainly not the case. In fact, Our Lady of the Hour is the perfect example of one such billionaire who is very down-to-earth and gives all that she can to those in need. Who is she? Well, today, we're going to be talking about none other than Miss Mackenzie Scott, one of the most affluent women in the world. But wait how exactly did she come upon her vast, vast fortune? Today we're taking a peek inside the story of Mackenzie Scott, the mysterious $60 billion woman. Scott is known as Amazon's first employee, Jeff Bezos' ex-wife, and one of the world's richest women who is rewriting the philanthropy playbook. Let's get down, let's get down to business. Mackenzie was born on the 7th of April, 1970, in San Francisco, California. Her father was a financial planner, and her mother was a homemaker. From a young age, she had quite the knack for writing, and she began seriously writing when she was only six years old. In fact, she had even written a book titled The Book Worm that spanned 142 pages. Unfortunately, it was destroyed in a flood at the time. Mackenzie attended the Hotchkiss School in Lakeville, Connecticut and graduated in 1988. She then proceeded to enter the prestigious Princeton University, pursuing a degree in English. She studied under the legendary writer Toni Morrison, who has won various awards and accolades, including a Nobel laureate in literature. Morrison sang praises of Tuttle's ability to write, saying that she was one of the best students has ever had in her creative writing classes. Mackenzie had also worked as a research assistant to Morrison for her 1992 novel titled Jazz. Naturally, she was intent on establishing a career in writing and creating novels Mackenzie herself has said. I am a better person when I am writing, and I am probably a better mother because I can focus all that laser attention on these characters rather than worrying about my kids. This being said and I'm sure you can guess writing is not what gave her billions and billions of dollars. After graduating from Princeton and job hunting she eventually found herself applying for a quantitative hedge fund in New York called D.E. Shaw. Scott went for a research associate position, which she decided to apply for to help her pay her bills while she was working on her own novels. It was there at the company where she met Jeff Bezos, who was the firm's vice president and was the one who conducted Mackenzie's interview. I guess sparks flew between the pair because they began dating not long after. By 1993, the pair tied the knot. In 1994, both Scott and Bezos left D.E. Shaw. They moved to Seattle, where they both started Amazon. Now, if you've watched my other video detailing how Amazon started from the bottom and worked its way to becoming one of the largest and richest companies in the world, you might remember how I said that the company began in the couple's garage. Scott was one of Amazon's very first employees, helping Bezos build the Amazon name, come up with a business plan, secure accounts, and ship out early orders. She was also the one responsible for negotiating the company's very first freight contract. It was only when Amazon began to take off that Mackenzie stepped back and became less involved in how the business was being run. She then decided to devote her time to taking care of her family and developing her literary career, which she had put on a semi-hold while helping Jeff build up Amazon into the global giant it is today. When she was able to make more time for her writing, Scott wrote her debut novel called The Testing of Luther Albright in 2005, and she won an American Book Award for it in 2006. Morrison was all praises for the book, saying that it was a rarity, a sophisticated novel that breaks and swells the heart. Scott then got to work in writing her second novel, Traps, which was published in 2013. As evidenced by her book's positive reviews, Scott has indeed been able to establish herself as a writer. But remember what I said earlier about her not making her billions from her books. While technically Jeff is the main face behind Amazon as the story goes, Scott was there from the very start. On January 9, 2019, Jeff Bezos and Mackenzie Scott announced their separation on Twitter, and they seemed to have confirmed that their message had officially dissolved in early April. The pair exchanged kind words about one another on the social platform, with both saying that they were grateful for the love and gratitude they were receiving from family and from one another during a trying time. However, the National Enquirer published a scathing expose the day after, detailing Jeff Bezos' affair with a woman named Lauren Sanchez. At the end of it all, their communal property divorce let Mackenzie walk away with a whopping $35.6 billion in Amazon stock, 
with Bezos giving her 25% of the stake in the company or 4% of Amazon as a whole. Bezos was, of course, left with 75% of his shares, which, to be honest, is still worth a massive amount of money and continues to grow every day. Through obtaining such a large amount of money, Scott McKenzie became the third wealthiest woman in the world and was ranked the 22nd richest person in the world by Forbes in July of 2020, eventually earning the title of the world's richest woman by December 2020. Her net worth, a staggering, $62 billion. However, Mackenzie Scott acknowledges that there are millions across the globe that are in need of financial assistance. In May 2019 much like many other celebrities, she signed the Giving Pledge, where she promised to give away most of her wealth to charity. In 2020 alone, which we all know was a particularly terrible year for most businesses and individuals, Scott had already donated roughly $6 billion to charitable causes. In a Medium post, this is what Scott had to say. This pandemic has been a wrecking ball in the lives of Americans already struggling. Economic losses and health outcomes alike have been worse for women, for people of color, and for people living in poverty. Meanwhile, it has substantially increased the wealth of billionaires. The latest round of money went to 384 organizations, some of which are focused on meeting basic needs, like food banks, while others target organizational inequalities such as legal defense funds. Scott's donations come without earmarks. She says that her team's due diligence is intended to identify well-run, impactful organizations and to pave the way for unsolicited and unexpected gifts given with full trust and no strings attached. To help abate the effects of the virus and offer support, Scott has decided to give as much as she can to those in need, paying special attention to those operating in communities facing high projected food insecurity, high measures of racial inequity, high local poverty rates, and low access to philanthropic capital. The nature and rapid pace of Scott's giving are nearly unheard of in the philanthropic world. You think of all these tech fortunes, they're the great disruptors, but she's disrupting the norms around billionaire philanthropy by moving quickly, not creating a private foundation for her great-grandchildren to give the money away, Chuck Collins, director of the Program on Inequality and the Common Good at the Institute for Policy Studies, told the New York Times. With that, Scott far outpaced her ex-husband in the giving realm and rewrote the typical playbook for high-profile tech philanthropists, who often operate as if they know best not just in business, but in solving societal problems too. Their engineering or technocratic orientation to their business, their wealth creation, transfers over to their philanthropic practices, says Rob Reich, a Stanford political science professor, referring to tech superstars like Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates. To put it really crudely, technocratic philanthropy is a philanthropy that is done to people rather than with people. Asia's youngest billionaire is just 28 years old. Some people are born into extremely wealthy families and are destined to inherit billions of dollars when their time comes. However, this does not mean that they're not hustlers themselves. After all, you do need to keep working to keep your empire alive. And that's exactly the story of our man of the hour. Jonathan Kwok may be a name you haven't heard of before, but you would be amazed to know that this man is Asia's youngest billionaire. He has a whopping net worth of $2 billion, and he is in charge of one of Hong Kong's largest and most powerful companies. His video, up on your screen now. Stay tuned, stay educated.